T-minus 17, final guidance release. We'll expect engine ignition at 8.9 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, ignition sequence started. All engines are started. We have ignition, 2, 1, 0, we have a liftoff. We have a liftoff and it's lighting up the area. It's just like daylight here at Kennedy Space Center. The Saturn V is moving off the pad. It is now clear the tower. Launched at 12.33 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on December 7, 1972, Apollo 17 was the final flight of the Apollo program and the only mission to include a nighttime launch. The launch was reportedly visible as far as 500 miles up the eastern seaboard of the United States. In command was veteran astronaut Eugene Cernan. Cernan had previously flown to the moon aboard Apollo 10, making him one of only three astronauts to have flown to the moon twice. Joining Cernan as command module pilot was Ronald Evans. A native of Kansas, Apollo 17 was Evans' first and only spaceflight. Also aboard, serving as lunar module pilot, was Harrison Schmidt. A geologist by trade, Schmidt was the only scientist to walk on the moon. It took the crew of Apollo 17 approximately 12 minutes to enter orbit 93 miles above the Earth. Just over 50 minutes after launch, the crew aboard the spacecraft and ground controllers in Houston received telemetry indicating one of the batteries powering the Saturn V's instrumentation unit may be faulty. Developed by IBM, the instrumentation unit was the brains of the Saturn V launch vehicle. Mounted between the rocket's third stage and the Apollo spacecraft, it stood at 23 feet tall and weighed in at about 4,000 pounds. Containing the navigation, guidance, control, and sequencing equipment, the instrumentation unit was essential for the flight and the trip to the moon. Soon, ground controllers concluded that the telemetry was faulty and that the instrumentation unit was functioning normally. At 2 hours 53 minutes ground elapsed time, capsule communicator and future shuttle astronaut Bob Overmeyer reported to the crew of Apollo 17 the news they had been waiting for. They were go for translunar injection. They were go for the moon. And very faintly we copy the crew reporting S4B ignition. That's confirmed uh, by the telemetry. Booster reports the thrust looks good on the S4B. This burn was initiated at an altitude of about 97 nautical miles above Earth. Uh, when finished, the spacecraft will be at about 150 miles above Earth and on its way to the moon, some 213,000 nautical miles away. With the TLI burn completed, the next major milestone on the flight plan was for Command Module Pilot Ronald Evans to dock with the lunar module and pluck it from its protective adapter for its trip to the moon. Okay, we're free. Uh, rates look pretty good. Let's plug it together. Ready. She's uh, lined up, not bad. Okay. Uh, prime one. Mark it. Stand by. There she comes. The maneuver a success and with the spent S-4B stage of the Saturn V falling away from their spacecraft, the crew of Apollo 17 observed the Earth getting smaller and smaller as they raced toward the moon. As they continued on their outbound journey, Ronald Evans captured one of the most iconic images of the Apollo program, a full Earth set against the blackness of space. At just over six hours ground elapsed time, the spacecraft was nearly 24,000 nautical miles from Earth, traveling at a velocity of 12,300 feet per second. 
By day two of the mission, the crew of Apollo 17 was settling into the routine of life aboard their spacecraft. 24 hours since launch, the crew was almost 98,000 nautical miles from Earth. They continued to report on their observations and to snap photographs of an ever-shrinking home planet. On day three, the crew removed the tunnel hatch that separated the lunar module from the command module to enter and inspect the lunar module ahead of the landing scheduled in just two days. The vehicle passed inspection and was deemed ready for its flight to the lunar surface. Day five of the mission began for the crew of Apollo 17 at 81 hours 30 minutes ground elapsed time. They were now about 17,350 nautical miles from the moon falling toward it at nearly 3,600 feet per second. This day would see the crew of Apollo 17 enter orbit around the moon. Also on this day, the landing crew would take their place in the lunar module and land it on the lunar surface. 88 hours and 43 minutes since lifting off from the Kennedy Space Center, the crew of Apollo 17 coasted behind the moon. Before they did, they offered this observation to the folks in Houston. Just to round out things as we uh, pitch back into uh, LOI attitude, uh, lo and behold, from over the top of the lamp came the Earth. Put the whole thing in one big package. Interesting, Gordo. We can uh, we can see uh, right over South America, and of course we can see up the Gulf Coast, and that looks like Houston's uh, covered with clouds, but uh, poetically enough, we can see the Cape. At least we can see Florida. How about that? While behind the moon, Ron Evans would fire the spacecraft's big engine to slow it down and allow it to enter lunar orbit. If all went as planned, the crew would re-emerge in orbit around the moon at 89 hours, 16 minutes, and 29 seconds ground elapsed time. Until then, all mission controllers in Houston could do was wait. This was Apollo Control, 89 hours, 15 minutes, ground elapsed time. Some 55 seconds until Apollo 17 comes from behind the moon on the start of the first lunar orbit. We're waiting word from a communications officer that we have indeed uh, gotten a signal and telemetry from the spacecraft. Once Apollo 17 came around the moon, the command module would, for the remainder of the mission, be called America. America. Houston, this is America. You can breathe easier. America has arrived on station for the challenge ahead. Very good. Uh, we've been hearing you for a couple minutes now. Uh, we've had a ground sight problem, but uh, you're loud and clear now. Apollo 17 had safely entered lunar orbit. The crew would circle the moon 12 times before Cernan and Schmidt would enter the lunar module called Challenger for their trip to the moon's surface. The two spacecraft undocked on the far side of the moon. Visual inspection of both vehicles were made and final preparations were completed for landing. At 112 hours, 49 minutes and 56 seconds, ground elapsed time, the lunar module engine was ignited and Challenger began its descent to the lunar surface. This video captures Challenger's descent and landing as seen from the lunar module windows. We hear Lunar Module Pilot Schmidt calling out altitude and descent rates as Commander Cernan takes control of the vehicle. Going down about two, very little dust, very little dust. 40 feet, going down at three. Stand by for touchdown, stand by. 25 feet, down at two. Feels good, 20 feet. Going down at two, 10 feet. 10 feet, Back contact. Okay, Houston, the Challenger has landed. Houston, you can tell America that Challenger is a Taurus literal. Just about four hours after touchdown, Cernan prepared to take his first step on the moon. But before he did, he had a message for hundreds of thousands of people watching back on Earth. I'm on the uh, footpad in Houston. I step off at the surface at Taurus Litro. We'd like to dedicate the first step of Apollo 17 to all those who made it possible. 
Schmidt soon joined Cernan on the surface of the moon. The two men planted a flag on the surface to memorialize their landing site. Uh, Roger 17, and uh, presuming to speak on behalf of some of those who work in the Moker, uh, we thank you very much. The astronauts then got to the business of science and exploration. Over the next three days, the crew would drive their lunar roving vehicle more than 22 miles on the lunar surface. Their first exploration on the moon included a geological survey of Steno Crater just south of their landing site. By the end of their first lunar excursion, Cernan and Schmidt had collected over 31 pounds of lunar samples. Day two on the moon included a traverse to Nansen Crater, nearly five miles from the safety of their lunar outpost Challenger. It was the farthest any crew ventured from the lunar module while on the moon. From there, the astronauts headed to Shorty Crater. It was there that the astronauts discovered orange soil, which proved to be small beads of volcanic glass formed over three and a half billion years ago. Oh, hey! Wait a minute. What? Where are the reflections? I've been through once. There is orange soil. Well, don't move it till I see it. It's all over. When Cernan and Schmidt concluded their second day of extravehicular activity, they had set a record for the longest EVA on the moon, 7 hours and 37 minutes. At 5.25 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on December 13, 1972, the men began the final moonwalk of the Apollo program. On this day, the astronauts would examine Tracy's Rock. Named after Cernan's daughter, the massive rock was as big as a house. Their final geological survey took place at Vansar Crater before they headed back to Challenger to close out the final EVA. Once they had returned to the lunar module, Commander Cernan unveiled a plaque affixed to one of Challenger's landing gears. To commemorate not just Apollo 17's visit to the Valley of Taurus Littrow, but as an everlasting commemoration of what the real meaning of Apollo is to the world, we'd like to uncover a plaque that has been on the leg of our spacecraft that we have climbed down many times over the last three days. And I'll read what that plaque says to you. Our here man completed his first exploration of the moon, December 1972 A.D. May the spirit of peace in which we came be reflected in the lives of all mankind. Then, at 10.54 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on December 14th, after 75 hours on the lunar surface, Cernan and Schmidt lifted off the moon for a rendezvous and docking with America and the ride home. Four days. Four days. Four. Engine arm is out Okay, I'm going to get the pro. 99, proceeded. Three. Two, one, ignition. Right that way, Houston. That's your good. Ag side. Good shoulder. shoulder. Right here you have good thrust. Okay, 30 seconds. 308, your number. Take okay, coming through 1,500 feet. And eight shot looks good. On the way home, Ron Evans became only the third person to perform a deep space EVA when he left the spacecraft to recover some film. Good enough? Am I clear? You're clear, babe. Go. Okay. Hup, big it all. Okay, did you see him? He's out. Roger. Am I on the tube? Uh, that's affirmative. Okay. Outstanding quality picture, Ron. You see me wave? That's affirmative. <laughs> okay. Beautiful. To this day, Evans remains the last person to have performed a deep space EVA. 
Two days after Evans' trip outside the spacecraft, the crew of Apollo 17 slammed into the Earth's atmosphere. Traveling close to 25,000 miles per hour, the 5,000 degree Fahrenheit spacecraft looked like a fireball looking out the windows. At 24,000 feet, America's drogue chutes deployed, helping to slow the vehicle's descent. Eventually, the main chutes deploy and slow America's descent to a mere 32 feet per second. Then, 12 days, 13 hours, 51 minutes, and 59 seconds since launch, the crew of Apollo 17 splashed down in the Pacific Ocean. Within minutes, the crew was picked up by helicopters from the nearby recovery vessel USS Ticonderoga. Once aboard Ticonderoga, Commander Cernan addressed the crew. I'm very really proud to be here. I'm proud to be part of Apollo 17. I'm proud to be a proud master. I'm very proud to be a captain in the Navy. And most of all, I'm proud to be an American. This is Apollo Control with the helicopter safely on deck. The network controller, Dave Young, will hang the final plaque in the Apollo series on the upper wall of the control room here. And this circuit, known up until now as Gemini Control, then Apollo Control, will reappear as Skylab Control.